Welcome to No Filter. I'm Mia Friedman. It's not every day you get to interview the Prime Minister, but without wanting to be like braggy about it, for me, it's kind of every couple of years or every few months if you're talking about the ALP. I interviewed Julie Gillard, I interviewed Kevin Rudd about a year or two later, and I never got to interview the Prime Minister who came next, Tony Abbott, even though I did talk to him off the record several times when he was opposition leader. But Malcolm Turnbull is who I spoke to this week. And we wanted to share the interview with you soon after we recorded it. So his office reached out to me and said he could be available on Monday. This was on Friday, so I didn't have too long to get nervous. But I've met uh, Malcolm Turnbull quite a few times before. I happened to live in his electorate. And so I didn't feel nervous about him but obviously interviewing the Prime Minister is a big deal and it felt like there was a lot of pressure not as much pressure as actually being the Prime Minister of course but everyone has their own agenda so you know there'll be people that think I'm too pro-Malcolm people who think I'm too anti-Malcolm people who think I'm a Labor stooge or a Liberal stooge people who think I'm too weak people who think I'm trying to be Lee Sales well I'm going to tell you, Lee has got nothing to worry about because I decided, given that I only had 20 minutes and that I was not Lee, I really had to limit what I asked him about. And I also knew that if I asked him about policy things, when you ask a politician questions about policy, they do love it, but they go on a very sort of rehearsed, on message kind of autopilot. And I didn't want that because... You can get that from a lot of different people that interview the Prime Minister. What you can't get is some of the other side of him. I wanted to ask him about things that were a little bit different. I wanted to ask him about vaccination. I wanted to ask him about his marriage. I wanted to ask him about women and being MPs when they have young families and men and whether Canberra is basically incompatible with having a young family and wanting to be around. What I didn't expect is that we would end up looking at wedding photos, his wedding photos on his phone, which he could just access almost immediately. Like he was telling me about he and Lucy, and I have to say his eyes just light up when he talks about her, uh, which made me kind of swoony because there's nothing more beautiful than a man who's deeply in love with his wife and deeply respectful of his wife. And whenever he talks about Lucy, he almost sits up a little bit straighter and, you know, gets this look in his eye, which is kind of like marriage goals. The other funny thing is that halfway through the interview, you'll hear it on the tape, us being interrupted and Kylie Rogers, our managing director who came with me, said, oh, excuse me, I've got to interrupt the interview. Facebook Live has crashed because we were recording this podcast, we were doing live on Facebook and we were also just recording our own video. So what could possibly go wrong? We had a crew of 10 people We had a special sound recorder who we we got in for the day because we really didn't want anything to go wrong. So, of course, something had to. And that's always a bit awkward when that happens in the middle. But we got it back on track. We lost our mojo a little bit, but we got it back on track. And um, I feel like the interview could have gone on for ages and ages. So, look, I hope you enjoy this. It's not your usual political interview. So, please don't judge it by those standards. And please don't judge me by the standards of Lee Sales because I will fail. Here's Malcolm Turnbull. Malcolm, good, good to, to be, be with, with you. you. Yeah, good great. to see you. I wanted to start off by asking you if being Prime Minister is what you thought it would be. Well, yes, yes. But I don't think anyone knows what being Prime Minister is like until you become Prime Minister. But mm. I'm a very, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm a very happy Prime Minister and I'm, enjoy, I'm enjoying the job. It was interesting when I, when I said to people, what would you like me to ask the Prime Minister about? And mm. there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mm. comments. And everyone feels like you should be fixing everything about their life, you know? There were some that would that came through some themes, but it was this one and that one. And I thought, how different is it when you are at the top of the tree versus being either in opposition or a sort of a leader in waiting? How is it different when there's this expectation that you can just come in and fix everything? Well, how do you deal with that? Well, I think it's, I think it's very important to be a good explainer as well. Mm. You've obviously got to be able to, to fix things and, you know, people want solutions and that, that, that's right, that's my job. Uh, a lot of wicked problems end up on my desk. But equally, you've got to be able to explain the environment and the, the choices that we have, the options that we have, so mm. people understand what we're operating with. You always said that you, you thought that the Australian people was, were underestimated and that you thought that if things were explained with nuance, hmm. that they would get it. 
Is that still what you think now? Absolutely. I, I do I do believe it's important. Mm. This is why it's great to talk to you mm. here. It's at a little bit more length than you might mm. uh, get on the nightly news mm. to actually talk about issues and discuss them and explain them. Uh, because I, I think there's a thirst for, for knowledge and information that people want to know, and it's important to be able to, to spell it out. Mm. So fake news right. I want to ask <laughs> you about, because um, you <coughs> made an important... Uh, announcement mm. about vaccination yesterday. Yes. And as you know, Mamma Mia has been campaigning for vaccination awareness and, and mm. vaccination uptake for more than a decade now. Well done. Um, thank you. And the yeah, anti vaxxers further to go. We really do. Mm. And the anti vaxxers were really the start of fake news in many ways, or they were pioneers of fake mm. news in that they were disseminating information that was entirely false, but which a lot of people to this day believe. What do we do about that? Well, we just have to do a better job at telling the truth and getting the facts out there. You see, what, what, there's been a big transformation in the media, and Mamma Mia is part of it, of course, one of the really good parts of it. Uh, but there's also a troubling aspect. If you go back a generation or so, mm. all of the media was curated. You know, there, was, there wasn't that much of it. There were some newspapers and radio stations and TV stations. And to get, on, to get your message on them, mm. to get on that, that station, you had to mm. get past a director and a producer and so forth. And things had to be fact-checked and... Yeah, it, 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 largely. And mm. now you've got the internet, which is a completely open field. The barriers to entry are virtually minimal. Are minimal. So anybody can get on there and you get an enormous amount of information and news, quote-unquote, mm. which is uh, not very accurate and is certainly not fact-checked. In fact... Sometimes it might be fact-checked to just in case there is a fact in it and the fact can be taken <laughs> out. So it's really important for people to be very discerning and to be very good uh, consumers of news mm. and to recognise, you know, some sources, some people are more reliable mm. than others. Some sources of information are more dependable. Mm. So we had obviously the, <coughs> the um, drama last week of not just some crank anti-vaxxer, but um, an elected representative in Pauline Hanson, mm. head of One Nation, coming out and making untrue statements about vaccination. What I don't like about it is the, the blackmailing that's happening with the government. Don't do that to people. We, we, that's a dictatorship. And I think people have a right to investigate themselves. If this having vaccinations and having measles vaccinations is actually going to, you know, stop the, these diseases, fine, no problems. But so, but there's also a case. Some of these it vaccinations... Could be it could be dangerous recommending that. Barry, some of these, and parents are saying, vaccinations have an effect on some children. Go and have your test first. You can have a test on your child first and make sure that it's not going to have a reaction Take on your child. advice from the doctor. Which I... Uh, corrected, I mean, mm. in the sense of making... I made it very clear within hours of that. In fact, mm. I think I was in Indonesia. Uh, within hours of those statements being made, I made it very clear that if you choose not to vaccinate your child, mm. you put your child's health at risk, but also the health yeah. of everybody else's children. And that message is one that we, are, we, are, you know, we are, will continue to make very strongly. And as you saw the mm. announcement over the weekend... So it's not just no jab, no pay. Mm. We're asking the states to work with us to ensure it's no jab, no play. So in other words, if you're not vaccinated, if your child isn't mm. vaccinated, unless they've got a medical exemption, mm. a medical exemption, mm. then they, should not be, they won't be able to go to a childcare centre or a preschool. How do we, which is fantastic <coughs> and, and we very much support that, but, you know, I suppose I see anti-vaxxers falling into two categories. One are the people who are deliberately trying to propagate false information. Mm. And then there are those who would just have maybe been exposed to something Pauline Hansen said or something they've read on the internet or a video they've seen on Facebook and are just scared and don't know who to trust. How do we as media organisations and as government help people understand the difference about what information is credible and what information isn't credible? Well, I think that's where it's important for authority, and when I don't mean the authorities, I mean it's mm. people to speak with authority who know what they're talking about, and that's where I think a, a you know an established uh, media brand or outlet mm. like yours has a responsibility to make sure that what you put out there mm. is accurate, is factual, is reasonable, is considered, uh, and that's because because you can see a tendency in the media, in the hyperactivity of some of the media, that it becomes as, as um, if you like, as, uh, as focused on clickbait. Mm. Some, some publishers 
as in fact the social media, is what you're seeing in the uncurated media. So it's really important, I think, for publishers with a brand, with a credibility, like Mamma mm. Mia, or mm. indeed like the ABC, mm. or News or Fairfax, mm. uh, to be responsible, to make sure that you've got to be responsible about what you're putting out there, because those brands take, bring with them credibility. Mm. It's also important, I think, for governments to make, particularly on matters of health, and we do. I mean, there's a lot of Health education information out there. Mm. Education is very important. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, I'm sick of experts. I don't want to hear about yeah. experts. Well, you know, seriously, if you're going to have an operation, are you going to go to the, uh, to the doctor, the specialist, or are you just going to, you know, ask somebody uh, mm. that you met on the bus to mm. uh, have, a, you know, have an amateur slash mm. at you? I mean, really. I mean, we've got to be... We've got to recognise that... that expertise is very important, particularly in the area of health, mm. and policies have to be based on evidence and on vaccination. I mean, the evidence is clear. Mm. You know, the, the public health benefits to vaccination are gigantic. So when people know. say, do your own research... I apologise, our Facebook Live is down. It's just so working on that phone. I don't know. Okay. So it's Everything else is video. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. All right. If we have to keep going, we'll just keep going yeah. if we've got video. Okay, we'll keep going. All right. Um, because fake news, obviously, it, it becomes very confusing for people, doesn't it? You know, you've got this idea of alternative facts and this idea of if someone just doesn't like something or agree with it, they call it fake news. And that's why this idea of do you research about something like vaccination, the research has been done, right? Sure. Well, that, that's right. And, of course, there is a... It, the, when, when you are looking for information about health matters or mm. medical matters... Uh, you should be looking to the sources that have got authority. So the health, you know, the, the Department of Health. And not Pauline uh, Hanson. Focus on the people that know what they're talking mm. about. And mm. that is exactly what you're doing. I always, you know, make, get back to that point. If you're going to have a, a surgical procedure, would you go to a surgeon? No, or would you go to someone, you, you know, <laughs> someone you just happened to bump into yeah. in the street who thought they'd rather like the idea of, um, mm. of uh, having a practice. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, which kind of brings me to this idea of polarisation and how everything is so extreme now. Mm. And back to when you always said you like explaining things and you... Mm. you do we, is there room for nuance? I mean, now we have a situation where people either vehemently agree with you or you get death threats about something, mm. you know? So we are so polarised and, and we saw that with Trump and the bubble. Mm. How do we as politicians and media organisations... We deal with this polarisation. Well, I, th I think that often people express themselves more extremely uh, online than they That's actually true. would behave in public. Uh, the, I remember, you know, I've often found um, over the years uh, when so somebody might send, might have sent this is going back quite a few years now. Someone would send me a, a an email, you know, to mm. my parliamentary address. Mm. Wishing me all sorts of you bad must have things. Got some great ones of those. And yeah. Often I would write back and say, you know, thank you very much for your email. I hope that made you feel better. To which the reply would very often be, oh, I didn't think you'd read that. I'm so sorry. And then you'd end up with a more civilized. Because uh, they just discourse. want to shout into the ether. Yeah, I think that's right. It's a bit. I've often thought it's a bit like, um, you know, kids um, going under a uh, under a railway bridge and screaming at the top of their. <laughs> Uh, voices when mm. the train goes over because they think no one can hear them. But there is a little bit about that, and the, the, that, that is a, a more civilised, reasonable discourse online is important. And again, mm. that's why if you're able to provide, as you do, mm. a safe and reasonable environment in which people can disagree and argue mm. and debate, that's very important. The civilised well discourse is very important, yeah. Correct. As I said, we asked people what they wanted me to talk to you about, and sure. our audience is predominantly, or the majority of our audience is heterosexual women, and yet marriage equality mm -hmm. came out um, as one of the top things that, that people wanted to know about. What's the path? We know that you're a supporter um, and mm -hmm. have been for many years. It feels like it's completely dropped off the agenda, and it feels like Parliament's really out of step with the population. Well, I, I think the... Again, and I'll be as I'll be as ob objective about this as I possibly can be. The facts are that if we had, if the Labor Party had agreed, allowed the Senate to mm -hmm. support the plebiscite proposal that we took to the election as our commitment, the vote would have been held in the first week of February, 
uh, unless all of the polls were completely and utterly wrong, it mm. would have been carried easily mm. and gay couples would be able to get married today. Now, that's the fact. So, so the Labor decided for very political reasons to oppose the plebiscite. Bill Shorten, three years before, had actually said to the Australian Christian lobby he supported a plebiscite. So he was very cynical and A lot of and gay organisations and gay families said that they were concerned and they were oh, concerned that. that it would... The, the no vote, and, and I, I've seen some of the potential mm. advertising around the no vote, and it was very upsetting and vilifying. So there were, there were good reasons for that. No, I understand the reasons that were put against it, mm. against a plebiscite, plebiscite, but it was a commitment that we took to the election. So can say, the next if, election... If well, well, you have uh, a different commitment. Well, we will. I mean, that's that. That will we'll wait till the next election before we set out all our policies for the next election. Mm. But right in the here and now, mm -hmm. the only reason, in my view, that gay couples can't get married in Australia is because Bill Shorten blocked the plebiscite going through the Senate. Now, so where it, does it, it stand now? Well, it it stands at an impasse mm. because because we have an election policy of a plebiscite, mm. which whatever criticism you may make of it was certainly thoroughly democratic. Now, I would have Lucy and I would have voted yes. Mm. I mean, I, I I think the the biggest threats to marriage are neglect, uh, disrespect, abuse, uh, you know, lack of lack of love, frankly, mm. Mm. Uh, those are the threats to marriage. I don't, Lucy and my marriage is not threatened by a gay couple down the road getting married, no. believe me. Uh, so I, so if there is, if there had been a plebiscite, we mm. would have voted yes for it. But it was a, I think it was a real missed opportunity on the part of mm. the Labor Party because again, you know, it was a, it was a very calculated political decision. I mean, back in 2013, Mr Shorten went to the Australian Christian lobby, who'd always argued for a plebiscite, and he told them he mm. agreed. And then, in 2016, it suited his political purposes to oppose it. And, of course, he had some arguments against it. I'm not denying there are arguments against it, but there are obviously very powerful ones arguments for, for it, it, not least of which was that we took it to, to an election. More with Malcolm Turnbull in a minute, but first, a message from our sponsors. Kate Ellis last week um, resigned <clears throat> from Parliament. Um, yeah. She said she won't be contesting the next election, so she's still got a couple of years to go. But there was a lot of um, debate and sort of mm. hand-wringing um, about whether it's possible to be a, a female MP or a male MP who wants to be involved in the lives of their children and um, be in Canberra. Three of the four um, Liberal women in your cabinet don't have children. Kelly O'Dwyer has a young family. Yeah, and... and uh about to have, have another, <laughs> have another. second yeah. or third. It's a second. It's okay. an expanding family. Yeah. So, you know, how do? You, what's the answer, or is there just no answer? <coughs> how do we get more mm. people who are? I spoke. You used to speak to mm. Joe Hockey about this. Mm. So it's not just something for women. Sure. Joe Hockey was terribly um, overwrought about not being around for his kids. How is there a way, or is it just something that you have to say? Being an MP or being in Parliament is fundamentally incompatible with being around a lot for your children when they're young? OK, well, Lucy and, Lucy and I, mm. uh, through our business career, have always made... We've always ensured that our workplaces were very flexible and mm. we've always been big users of technology and ensured that it that uh, people can did not have to spend more time in the office than, than they needed to. Mm. And so I've always been committed to optimising that work family balance mm. and and you know and of course we can do it more easily now than ever thanks to technology mm. now the the problem with parliament on the other hand is you can't teleconference into the house of representatives so do you think so one day you'll be able to i doubt i doubt it that's a, i really doubt that but the but the so the challenge is you are away from home a lot yeah and so you need to have as a as a politician uh whether you're a man or a woman mm you need to have a really great partner. You mm. need to have a great partner that can back you up. That can that lean into the family when lean, you have to lean, lean into, into Canberra. The now, of course, politicians are not the only ones that are away from home a lot. There are plenty mm. of other people, whether they're in business or whether they're in the ADF, uh, uh, you know, in the Defence Forces, or, you know, or, they're, or they're, they're working for airlines and so forth. Lots of people spend a lot of time away from home. But with politicians, if you, and, you know, unless you come from Canberra, mm. You would be away from home at least half a year, around, uh, no, twenty I would, weeks. I would say about a third of the year, mm. in practical terms. And if you're a minister, 
or a shadow minister, mm. it's quite a bit more. So, yes, it, I would think yeah, a Josh minimum... Josh Frydenberg has a young a family, of Tanya half Plibersek. Year. So some so, do. So having that strong family support is very important. But it is, it is a... You know, we, we've made the parliament a little bit more mm. family friendly in the sense that it doesn't sit till midnight anymore now, or the mm. House of Representatives And there's a creche on site. There is a childcare centre, but of course that's, so that's, that's fine until your child goes to school, of course, mm. uh, as opposed to being a... Yeah, true, a, which is a, what a, Kate's will be doing. That's right. I, I spoke to Kate on the weekend. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a tough choice she's made. And you made, could see how anguished she was. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, look, but ultimately every family, yeah. every family's got to make those Did you give calls. her any advice? <laughs> no, I just... I just, just just gave her my sympathy and yeah. my... It, it, but sympathy in the sense of support and understanding mm. and, you know, sorry to see you won't be running again, uh, but... Um, Maybe she, you'll be back. Yeah, well, who knows? She, she's, she's, you know, she, she's got plenty of time. She, she does. She could well do that. You mentioned Lucy, and I wanted to ask you about her. You know, Cheryl Sandberg said the most important career decision a woman will make is the partner she chooses. Mm. You and That's, Lucy... That goes for men too, by the way. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and and as Annabelle says, women need wives and men need lives. But... Um, <laughs> You know, Lucy's had a phenomenal career. She yep. was the, the mayor of Sydney and she's mm -hmm. been a, a, a star as much as you have. Have you had to make any sacrifices for her? Have you both sort of leaned in and out? You had, you know, when you were rising through the ranks, you had young children. Yeah. How do we've, you guys work it well, out? We've always supported each other. It's Seems been like a, that. Yeah, it's been a good partnership and we have, each of us have compromised uh, to support the other, mm. um, you know, I, look, I would have to say I think Lucy's probably compromised more to support me than me mm -hmm. her. But there have been choices in our, in, in our lives where I've made decisions. You know, I've compromised in the sense of, of, of making decisions that were focused on supporting her. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it is, but but you know, Lucy and I are very close, and I have and, and I know <laughs> we've been together for a very very long time. You know, we'll be shortly celebrating our 37th wedding anniversary and we were together for a few years before that so, so 40 years odd uh yeah it's getting close more to more than half years. your life uh qu quite a lot more yeah. than half my life i'm not 80. <laughs> so, i'm not good at maths no, so well, good. Well, well we got we met when i was How did you uh, meet? we uh, oh, i was a, a, it's a, just not far from here lucy's dad uh tom hughes uh, was then uh, a QC. He still is a QC, but he was the he was one of the leading, if not the leading, barristers, trial mm. lawyers. And um, I was a young journalist at the Bulletin, and I was writing a story about him. So I went down to see, interviewed this very scary person. How old were you? Oh, 22, something oh, like that. Yeah, yeah, 22 or around that. 22, maybe a bit older. 22, actually, I was 22. And I went down to see Tom, and. Um, and to interview him, and uh, I, I spoke to him, and Lucy was a law student, she was 19, and she was working in his chambers doing some noting up, you mm -hmm. know, of law reports and generally earning a bit of, you know, money during the, mm. uh, during the holidays, I guess. So I, I, I spoke to her and I was totally entranced and I interviewed the great man, and uh, subsequently mm. I sent her a bunch of flowers to her father's chambers. Ah, smooth. She was not there, however, <laughs> and her dad came home because Lucy was living with her father. He was, he'd been divorced and she was basically looking after him. Mm. Uh, and uh, she, he came home with a bunch of flowers and said to Lucy, uh, you know, that Malcolm Turnbull's a very charming young man. He was so appreciative of the time I gave him for the interview, <laughs> he sent me this bunch of flowers. <laughs> so Lucy, of course, said... Let me have a look at the flowers. <laughs> she said there. He for genuinely me. thought they were for him. Well, that's certainly Who knows? the impression yeah, he yeah, created, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Oh, that's and so the and that is how that is how we met. Now Tom forgave me after some years for not uh, sending him sending the flowers. Sending him flowers. Can but you imagine as a journalist, junior journalist at the Bulletin, if you'd have sent him flowers, that in itself would have been hilarious. Yeah, well, anyway. So it worked. So you guys started worked. dating that yeah, we started, early. We started. Yes, we started dating, and we and then she came over to. Um, she came over to uh, visit me in at Oxford in 19 uh, end of actually end of 1979, mm -hmm. and um, and we got married in March 1980 because I persuaded her to stay. Uh, and uh, and in fact, you know that's a good example. Lucy missed out on a law, year of law school. She shouldn't have, but mm -hmm. the law school were pretty unreasonable, I thought. 
And so we went back to Australia earlier than we otherwise would have so that she could finish law school. You know, mm. that was a good example of the way we've worked together. But getting married was, was, was a funny story too. So we went along to see the... Uh, we're living in this little cottage just outside Oxford, mm. a little village. How old are you now? And you, how long uh, have you been I dating was, So this is, this is uh, 1980, so I'm now 25, and Lucy is 21. Oh, she's so nearly young. 22. She's, very, just, she's eight days short of 22. God. So she always says she should, if she'd waited nine days, she could have she been married been at 22, 22 instead of 21. 21 sounds very young. Like it if, does. If Daisy you got married at 21, <clears throat> you would have been a bit like, are you sure? Well, she, well it, she, she chose a wonderful man. She so, did. No, yeah. but still 21 seems young, 21 right? is young These days. By, by today's standards. Anyway, so we go along and we see the, the, uh, the it's an Anglican church there, Church of England Church in the village. We go along and see the, the priest and... Uh, he asked what religion we are, and, mm. and Lucy said, well, she's a Catholic. I said, I'm Presbyterian. And uh, he said, well, neither of you are members of my mm. church. Why, why, I go to the registry office. It's got nothing to do with me. <laughs> and I, so I said to him, uh, I said, look, the Church of England is an established church in the United Kingdom. Isn't that right? And he said, yes, it is. I said, so you are effectively a public servant? And he said, yes. I said, now, you have a constitutional duty to prevent fornication in your parish. And Miss Hughes and I are making no admissions, but we are young and in very good health and sorely tempted. And so you have the opportunity mm. to marry us and put everything to right. And he thought that was so it's funny. very good argument. He's so funny, he agreed to marry That's us. Fantastic. And years later, years later, <laughs> the, the, the tail end of that, the footnote to that story, is when the kids were about, Alex would have been about 12 and Daisy would have been 10, and we're in the UK, and they wanted to see where mum and dad had got married. And so we were up in that part of the country, so mm. we went and showed them this little church, and who was there <gasps> but the old priest. And he was so thrilled to see us. Oh, so, and she said, look, lucky, you stopped the fornication, but here are the but, children. Well, we, no, we made no admissions. No we were admissions. both lawyers. No, no it's true. Admissions. It's true, both no lawyers. No admissions, but we did concede we were in good health. And so you met him again and he yeah, felt yeah. proud of his yeah, handiwork. Yeah, Neil Durand was his name. Yeah, very nice man. Um, my last question's about that. You know, being Prime Minister is a commitment for the two of you, I imagine. Um, yeah. You know, how do you, not how do you keep it fresh, but do you have date nights? We do, we do. Do you? It's a, it's a very important... Just you and the Secret Service. It's very, <laughs> it's very important... One of the keys to a happy marriage is making time for each other. Mm. Relationships, you've got to keep investing time into them. It's really important. It's very easy uh, because of Especially the demands after 37 of work years. and children. Yeah, you've just got to keep on, you know, the, the ideal is to be each other's best friend. And that is, mm. that is absolutely, Lucy and I are each other's best friend. In fact, I have a, um, a much stronger sense of Lucy and me than I do of me. You know, very much... I see, we see each other as being uh, part of partner. a... Partner. Uh, yeah, as part partners. of a whole. Part of a whole, yeah, that's right. And how do you stop it from being all about you now that you're the Prime Minister? Like, everywhere you go, everyone is Mr Prime Minister and everything. Yeah. So how do you, well, Lucy, do you have to... Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, can I tell you that Lucy's, well, Lucy and I have a lot of things in common that we talk about, nat mm. you know, naturally, our children and grandchildren, of course. But Lucy's the Chief Commissioner of the Greater Sydney Commission, so mm. she's responsible for... Um, the putting together the big city plans, metropolitan mm. plans, cities and planning is a big uh, priority for my government. Uh, so we have our city deals, we you have, have our those housing in affordability uh, agenda, we have a whole infrastructure agenda. So, you know, we, we've got a lot to talk about and we've both got a lot of interests, uh, which, you know, beyond family. Mm. So, so we, we're never short of things to discuss. On date night. How On often do you do date night? night? Well, often date night is just to, to, like tonight. It's just a night at home. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the best good. place. Well, enjoy tonight. Thank you so much for making. Thanks, Mia. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to No Filter. You can buy the PM's book called Fighting for the Republic at iBooks at apple.co forward slash Mamma Mia, and this is where you can also subscribe to all our other shows in one convenient place. Because who's got time to go to lots of different shows? And you know what? I don't even know how many shows we've got most weeks. Last week we launched another show. It's called Hello Bump. It's about pregnancy. It went straight to number one on iTunes and I can brag about that because I had absolutely nothing to do with it. It's co-hosted by Monique Bowley and Rebecca Judd who is very different to how 
I thought she would be. I only knew of her from Instagram and I'd heard through people who'd met her even just on red carpets and stuff and in interviews that she was delightful and down to earth. But I had no idea until I listened to this podcast how true that in fact was. All right, level with me. Have you drunk your own breast milk? Mm, Oh, yes. So good. Is it? So good. Like sweet, sugary. It actually, I mean, I don't mean to brag, but it tasted like a vanilla milkshake. It was so yum. Did you just like, you know? Yeah, well, I was expressing. Mm. And then I thought, well, he's getting it and he seems to like it, so I'm going to have a little taste myself. And it was delicious. (laughs) I'm Beck Judd. And I'm Monique Bowley. Hello, Bump. Mamma Mia's Pregnancy and Birth Podcast. Out now in iTunes or the Mamma Mia Podcast app. Um, she's the opposite of the sort of perfect life she sort of has on Instagram. It's just such a great listen. If you are pregnant or if you want to be pregnant someday, um, it's just, you, I just, even I learnt things. She's been pregnant with twins. God. Anyway, so what was I telling you? If you want all our podcasts in one place, even better than going to iTunes, is going and downloading the Mamma Mia podcast app. I'm now, when people come up to me and say, I love the podcast, my next question is always, have you got the app? And I think now I might start to ask people to prove it by showing me their phones. So really get the app. It's pink, looks great on every phone. Um, No matter what cover you put on your phone, no matter what type of phone you have, the podcast app looks good on it. If you would like to suggest a guest for No Filter or just ask me a question, or leave a comment. You can call, if you're a phone kind of a person, you can call the pod phone on 02 899 9386. Or better still, because I'm a person of words rather than voices, flick me an email at podcasts at mamamia.com.au. My producer on No Filter, Lies and I, read all your correspondence. We really do, and we love it. And speaking of lies, today's show was produced by Eliza Ratliff, also known as Lies, confusingly spelt E-L-I-S-S-A. That caused me a lot of problems when I first met her, but helpfully in the script, she's even written her own name phonetically, E-L-I-Z-A, which is really kind. The executive producer of podcasts is Monique Bowley, who I used to call Monique Bowley. Everyone's got a tricky name these days, I don't know. And the head of entertainment is Holly Wainwright, which I can pretty much pronounce. Thanks for listening and I will see you on the internet.